to the Children's Media Association. For those of you that are new to us, we are a global organization, a nonprofit working to connect, inspire, and inform those working across all the children's media verticals. Today, we are super excited. We have a very special guest with us. Amanda is the CEO of the research consultancy Fundamentally Children and Dr. Goomer's Good Play Guide, a consumer-facing review site for children's toys, apps, learning, and baby products. She has a PhD in neuropsychology, a postgraduate certificate in higher education, and over 20 years of experience working with children and families. Widely considered as the UK's go-to expert on play, parenting, and child development, her book Play was published May 2015 and has been translated into many different languages, with extracts being published in the Toy Industry Association's Genius of Play initiative, for which she is also an expert ambassador. Um, today, we're kicking off a series of talks with Amanda called Amanda Guma Presents, um, where we'll be discussing numerous topics surrounding kids and play. Today, we're focusing on what is going on with kids and how positive play can dramatically impact their lives. So having said all that, I will turn it over to Amanda and we will chit chat and go from there. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Susie. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk today about uh, well-being, particularly anxiety, and how positive play can really play a role, and what it is that we can do about um, helping well-being. It has always been um, an intrinsic part of our of our work here at um, Good Play Guide and Fundamentally Children, but it's, there's never been a more important time to shed a light on it. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. And it was it was really brought home to me recently. My eldest daughter is doing a year abroad in um, North Carolina State University. And she called me a month or so ago and she was saying that she was really upset because really sadly, one of the, the lads in her class had taken his own life. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about it a bit more. And, and she then told me that it was the seventh kid that year in that university that had killed themselves and I was flabbergasted yeah. I just it was it was it just brought it home to me how prevalent mental ill health is because these kids don't get to university and suddenly develop mental health anxieties yeah. um, they've been growing you know brooding for ages so as a children's working in the children's industry, I was like, we, we need to be doing so much more, so much earlier to help these kids develop the resilience because seven kids is way too many, but that's only the ones that actually went through with it. You've got that toxic environment where kids are really struggling with day-to-day -day, um, issues and it's just, it's blown my mind. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm really personally passionate about this as well as professionally. So it's great to have the chance to, to sort of talk about it a bit more today. Um, so just to give you a sort of an idea of what we're going to cover, um, Susie, I hope this is all right. We've got what, what is well-being? Why is it such a hot topic? I'm trying to find some examples of best practice, because, you know, if, if we're doing something right, let's do more of it. Um, and then let's put a challenge out to the industry. What is it that we can do? What should we be doing to, to help these kids develop that, you know, that mental well-being yeah. and reduce their anxiety? Okay, so my university lecturer always told me to define my terms, so I'm going to do the same to you guys. So, first of all, you can tell me what is well-being. Um, I'm a psychologist, and I know that if I talk at you for an hour, um, you're just going to go to sleep and start mind start wandering. Doesn't matter how invested you are in the topic. So, what I want you to do is commit to this. I want you to put your second screens down. I want you to focus on this because actually. I'm hoping that what we go through today might even help your own well-being as well. So, but first of all, if you can put in the chat or in the comments, um, what you consider well-being is. Susie, you got an idea? Or how would you define it? I think it's um, positive thoughts about yourself, about life, and about how you walk through life collectively. Um, not, you know, taming that that is inside of you so that you can live each day on the positive side of your internal narrative. Yeah, I love that. 
And I think it is. It's about that sort of internal narrative, isn't it? It's it's more. Um, it's not about the money. It's not about success. It's not about prestige. It's that state of being at peace with yourself, comfortable in your own skin, healthy, absolutely, and happy, but not not short term you know, dopamine happy, a general sense of contentment, I think. And I think it's it's really important to focus on well-being as a whole and not just, and I, I think the, the distinction between physical and mental health, I think, is possibly outdated. Um, and I think, you know, making sure that well-being covers everything, I think, is really important. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. I think that's a great, great person. Rachel's just uh, a great definition. Rachel's just put whole person, child health, including mental health, physical health, and a feeling of safety. I think mm -hmm. the safety is really important, and we're going to come on to that um, in a little bit more. Maybe so let's acceptance too, right, Amanda? Like, I think that's the other thing my daughter struggles with, like thinking about herself positively, but then also accepting that no one's perfect, and, and that's how we're all walking through life, you know? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that feeling, feeling accepting yourself and feeling accepted by others, absolutely, yeah. really, really important. Um, so I'm going to flip it on its head now. So let's define what we mean by anxiety. This is the, the problem we've got. I mean, we've got lots of different mental health issues, but anxiety seems to be the most prevalent and the most um, the, the biggest, the biggest factor in a lot of a lot of issues around today. So has anybody got a, a definition of anxiety? How would you, how would you, because everybody gets, everybody gets worried, right? We all worry about stuff. Right. But when does it become anxiety? I think that's the over-processing, right? The overthinking, the questioning, the doubting, all of the things that, um, you know, as we, I would say, mature, learn to, you know, filter, you know, I think teens especially struggle with anxiety right now because they're trying to fit in, they're trying to get good grades, they're trying to, you know, do sports. There's so many things we're asking of them at this part in their life, yet they're fundamentally trying to define who they are too. So I just think there's a lot of overthinking going on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, me. And the, the um, yeah, anxiety is definitely when all the good stuff is is on the rocks. It's, it's true. Um, and I think, it's that anxiety is a condition when it's a disorder. Um, it's a persistent feeling of unease. It's something that can't, you can't get rid of. It's sort of a nagging doubt, but it can be debilitating. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not a rational concern about a, a negative event because we can all worry about, you know, air pollution or traffic or whatever it is and have a sensible amount of, of sort of, oh, that's not good. And, and adapt our behavior accordingly. Yeah. And it's that heightened state of arousal um, without necessarily a justifiable cause. It might be something that is, is over-exaggerated or you worry, your, your, your worry or your anxiety levels in comparison to the real risk. And the, the parent one I've got as an example is fear of abduction. Mm. In the Victorian era, kids were getting kidnapped and nasty things done all the time. Today, it's safer than ever. Kids are increasingly not being abducted and parents are still absolutely petrified about it. So there's a there's an anxiety from parents as well. But I think it's that um, the exaggerated fear of something, but it's also the misappropriation of it. So you might be afraid of something that is so unlikely to happen, but but absolutely not bothered by something that, that could it, you know has a much higher probability so it's it's a sort of a um a misjudgment of the the actual risks and it's debilitating and it's because it's there all the time and actually the problem with anxiety is it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy because mm. you are so worried about something that you don't take any steps to do something different so because you're you're paralyzed by fear um and then you're ending up, up feeling helpless which then makes whatever it is you're worried about more likely to happen. So I think um, making, helping people balance that out um, is, is really, really important. Well, and I think it's especially hard in today's world just because of the heightened connectivity, all the news that gets shared within seconds of it happening. I just think that, you know, 
changes the landscape of how we receive information that creates some of the additional anxiety um, that we all feel. Yeah, and I think what we've got, I mean, that eco um, uh, report that, you, that the CMA has got, and if you haven't read it already, guys, please go and read it. It's, it's really important. Um, but the, the thing that I was getting that came to me from that was that kids are worried about this stuff, but with due reason. Yeah, you know, this is the one where, you know, they, they need to be worried, but their anxiety is is heightened because they don't know that they can do anything about it because maybe they can't. Maybe it's too late. Maybe they are, you know, they, they're just, they are worried. And it's it's really scary. I mean, things like, some of the stats in that report blew yeah. me away, 91% of 6 to 12-year-olds are concerned about climate change. And 4 in 10 of those are worried about having kids or may not have kids because they don't think the world is a good place to bring up children. And I think that's, you know, those kind of stats just blow me away. So this this is all in that um, uh, eco report that the CMA have got on their website. So go and go and look at that. But you can see why why the world is is it's confusing and scary and why anxiety is on the rise. And I think what we need to make sure we're doing is empowering children to do something about it rather than allowing their anxiety to get to a point where they're paralyzed through fear. Yeah. I mean, I would say that's the two, two of the main conclusions of our um, climate literacy report is that, A, we need to be able to speak openly and educate children about what's going on with the climate and then empower them to be a force, you know, to change things. And if we can do both of those things, that significantly reduces the anxiety around the climate. Absolutely. I mean, if you go back and, and look at sort of what's going on with the kids here, everybody's needs are I mean this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs I'm sure lots of you are familiar with it but if you've got that kind of physiological needs and the safety and security that's that's key and when you've got something as fundamental as an eco crisis environmental crisis that is threatening some of those very basic needs there's no wonder that you know people are nervous and anxious and and really struggling to focus on any of the other good stuff higher up the pyramid i think it's it's really important that we recognize that that the eco climate and the eco anxiety is about existential threats it's not just about people worried about you know whether their clothes are matching or whether their hair's right or whether that you know it's 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 not the usual teenage angst it's it's not about friendships and and boyfriends it's about it's about life and it's about their, their safety and security. And when you are in that, when your basic needs are threatened, you're in that fight or flight mode and you are in no way able to nurture and progress stuff higher up the, the pyramid. So I think when we're looking at things like education, we there's been a, a, quite a lot of um, research around or, or commentary around the need to... to catch kids up from the pandemic yeah. and how we need to you know focus on their education and their accomplishments and their you know their careers and their futures but it's not an either or if you don't have their well if they're not emotionally well and emotionally literate and, and are able to be resilient if they're in that fight or flight mode they're not going to learn anything anyway because they're not they're not receptive to that kind of, of information. So we need to get their their wellness needs being sorting out first before we focus on the education. And that is something that I spend my a lot of time banging my head against a brick wall with some parents who want to hot house their children. But actually, getting their getting their well being right isn't a luxury. It's a it's a building block. Right. No, I um, love that when you shared that that you really can't focus on you know, are force, forcing the educational development and criteria and scores and all of that when your child isn't whole themselves and open to all of that education and that support. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, completely. So, um, and I think now it's, it's, it's just so timely. Um, and I'm not a fan of reading off, um, um, PowerPoint presentations and stuff, but the, the pandemic has really exacerbated some of the trends that were already there before the pandemic, yeah. um, education trends and stuff, but things like school refusals, 
that's massively increased since the pandemic, partly because of parents um, having more flexibility sometimes to, if they're working remotely and or hybrid working. So it's not as important that their kids go to school because from a safety point of view, they're at home. Kids can kids can do it. It's not maybe not worth the battle. But there's all sorts of stats and um, stuff going on at the moment suicide rates increasing, um, truancy and dropouts from schools, parents' um, stress and concern around um, children. And this is in the developed countries. You've also got all of the, you know, we're not, we've not even touched on things like the nutri malnutrition and um, poverty and stuff like that, that that's also going on. And we go back to Maslow and they're the basic needs if we can't get those right. But it is, there is, I feel like it's a bit of a perfect storm. I think and that's that's kind of the the way I look at it. And it's a perfect storm for the industry as well, because it's not going to be easy for us to turn this around. Because on the one hand, we've got all the stuff that's going on in society. And on the other hand, we've got some industry related issues. So things like getting good funding for innovative startups, really difficult, um, increased competition for brands, especially in the preschool arena. Um, more barriers to entry and innovation with different reg regulations and certainly in the UK since we've left the EU you know we're we're struggling with making sure that we can trade with as many people as possible and the other thing that I think is happening on the in the society thing but has a massive impact is the fragmentation of media consumption by children so they're on multiple screens they're going in different places it's very hard to to catch them wherever they go and so brands and, and media production has to meet them where they're at but we've got to find where they're at um, and I think and as a researcher I've been trying to do some research into social media and young children but you can't find them because they're not allowed to be on social media so from a researcher's point of view they're invisible because yeah. Instagram and whoever else won't let you won't admit that they've got young children on their platform. We all know they're on there, but you can't research it ethically and thoroughly because they're invisible. So right. understanding where kids are at and being able to target them with the good stuff is actually really hard. And you end up with the less scrupulous people who get around those kind of things and, and just want to get, get eyeballs on their, um, on their content who, um, yeah, who end up going around the, the legislation and stuff. So, yeah. I think it's 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 tricky and we've got a job to do as an industry. We've got a really, really jo good big job to do. Well, and I think it also dovetails into um, something that we've talked about too, which is just sort of media literacy and making sure that kids understand since a lot of them are driving their own screen time, what's safe, what's not safe, how do we manage that? And as parents, what are those tools that we can give them to help them empower their kids to make sure that they do stay safe? I think all of that's really important as well. Yeah, and I think as adults, it's really important that we take a moment to look at our own well-being as well, because we are the models that kids kids copy. Um, so I'm going to, again, a, a question for, for the audience, if you like. What is it that your brand, your the industry as a whole, is doing to promote well-being within the industry? Because I think if we're going to be authentic about this, it's got to start from the top, right? So I know if we've got any managers heads of department, C-suites or board members in the audience who who are in a position to, to sort of model well-being initiatives. And if you've got any um, any best practices that you want to share that happen within your organisation or that you're aware of within the industry, stick them in the chat again, because I think it's really great if we can if we can adopt more of what's working well and we can be authentic as a brand. You know, I think I think that's. It's going to make it easier for, for the content that you create to be authentic and to really resonate if you if you're walking the walk. So any ideas for that would be great to hear as well. Susie, what do you do about sort of promoting well-being within the CMA? So I'm putting you on the spot here. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I think more than anything, 
uh, you know, a key lens for us is to ensure that we're sharing with the greater community resources that give them that knowledge and empower them to make those, you know, meaningful choices to impact what they're doing within the media landscape. I think the biggest question that we found when we've tackled certain topics is there isn't really, and what's something that we want to wrap our arms around and be for the industry is to aggregate all the different resources that people can have so that they know what they can do and how they can best implement it, what the success stories are, what the barriers to entry are. And that's really something that we are very passionate about at CMA, that we are that um, resource for people. Even in the climate literacy report, we have resources for how to build a green production, how to build green stories. So I think more than anything, what we've uncovered is there are wonderful, amazing, inspired resources out there. It's just how do we get those to a greater population of media folks so that, that we can truly create a wave of change across media. And so, uh, yeah, we're super passionate about it and something that we definitely want to do. And even as a producer, you know, when I'm developing a story, I am looking at how would a child feel with these different storylines, with these different character traits, all of that, because uh, personally, you know, in my production company, we're passionate about strong female lead content that really is transferable in terms of pe people, kids seeing themselves and feeling that that's someone that they want to cheer for and be a part of that story and learn more. So I think we all have to do our part. Absolutely. It sounds like the CMA is doing really well on that. So, yeah, nice, nice work. Um, and I think I think going back to the sort of the parents as well is um life is different now right it's 21st century parenting is is not how previous generations have had to parent and i think there's some key key factors that i think we again as an industry we need to be aware of um because that's going to influence how they how parents consume content with their children how parents approve content that their kids consume and how how parents relate to their kids when they are consuming the content that we're providing for them yeah. so the whole sort of always on social media pressures i think is is um something that we've all recognized but i think the other one that's really interesting is that less community cohesion so you don't have as many families where you've got aunt down the road, sister around the corner, and kids in and out of each other's house all the time. So as a parent, you're often much more isolated and you're bringing up your kids on your own without as, as wide a support network. Yeah. So the support becomes something that they're craving, but they don't know where to go. So brands that they trust are in a really good position to not only provide content for the kids, but to give the parents support and 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 information and, and evidence-based advice uh, to help them feel more in control. And, and we know that mental health is about agency. It's about feeling like you've got choices. It's about feeling like you, you can affect your life in a positive way. So giving parents tools to help them feel like they're being better parents is a really strong thing that, that you know, children's media can, can do to support families in, in these kind of really challenging times. Yeah, it's sort of the invisible community, right? Because the kids are always messaging each other versus actually going around the corner and seeing each other and spending time together. I remember when our girls were younger, we had a, you know, a bowl at the front door and everyone had to put their phone in because we would have hangouts at our house and all the kids are sitting in the living room on their phones. It's like, no, this is the time you actually interact with each other, you know? <laughs> And I yes. just think that's the sort of guidance that parents need how to pull the kids, you know, off their phones and engage and do things. I think sports is a wonderful way that that happens, you know, um, to get your kids involved in sports and different extracurricular activities, whether that's theater or sports or whatever it is, something that really encourages them to put down the phone and participate live and in person. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, we do a lot of work on the balanced play diet and giving kids a, a range of activities and uh, making sure that we are um, encouraging children's whole development. I think that that's all really important, too. Um, and I think the other thing to think about is that it doesn't have to be a zero sum. It's um, it can be a win win situation, because actually, if we're nurturing each other, then within within our within our organizations and our 
employees or our teams are then going home and feeling more nurtured and feeling more valued, they're going to be able to interact better with their families and they're going to be um, less stressed. And it's and then they then they have a, a happier family life, which makes them more productive at work anyway. So it's it's a real virtuous circle. If we can just flip it round, yeah. I think it's you know, and that I think you know one of the good things that's come out of the of the pandemic is that sort of hybrid working in, um, environment and a bit more flexibility. So I think pe- giving people those those choices um, has become a lot more viable. No, I absolutely agree. Yeah. I even agree too with what Megan's put in the chat too, that leading with empathy sort of drives that whole ecosystem that you're showing here. I think that that's a skill set um, that I think even as a parent or even, you know, as a leader within an organization, if you can embrace the thought process of what is this person going through before you go into your agenda it just sort of changes the whole conversation and something that i've seen at home and at work that's really a powerful tool so thank you megan yeah absolutely um and i think the that going back to that choice and having giving um the parents as well but but kids choice over their lives feeling like they have some agency and giving them some hope I think are really important because that learned helplessness and if you're interested in the the sort of the science behind that check out Seligman um, and his research into um, learned helplessness but giving children the opportunity to be um, to have decisions, they spend kids spend an awful lot of time being done to. You know, they have to go to school. They they get told what to eat. That's what's that's what's for dinner. They get sometimes they you know the young kids get told what to wear and who they're playing with and where they're going and who's coming around for for dinner or whatever it is. And they don't have an awful lot of control. And and rightly so for young children. You know, too much control will blow their mind. And you often get kids going into a playroom with a load of toys. And, and are paralyzed because there's too much choice. Right. But giving children that opportunity and ability to make decisions that affect them right from an early age. And that's where play is really powerful because, you know, do you want to build a tower or do you want to build a house with your block blocks? Or do you want to play with this game or that game? And do you want to, um, do you want to be the leader or the follower in this game? And, you know, it, all that, all those decision-making skills that give kids some, some control and, and, um, agency within within that space are teaching them skills for life and I think you know we need to make sure that we are not creating sort of a messaging that is so doom laden that that they end up just giving up because there's nothing we can do about it yeah. we need to give them the, the the tools and the you know it might be hard it might be a challenge but actually let's see what we can do here because you know you can do this because you have control and you can choose, make some positive choices. And I think, you know, media content that promotes children's empowerment and and gives them something that's relatable that they can, they can aspire to that is giving them hope in the future. I think that that is gold dust. And I think the other thing that is causing some of the anxiety is a lack of trust in the authority. And it's the same in the UK as it is in the US with our sort of trust in political leadership is, is at an all time low. Um, and when you don't trust the people who are making the decisions for you, not having the ability to make those decisions yourself becomes even more stressful and even more of a negative impact on your mental health because you don't trust the, the you know, kids grow up thinking that their parents are going to keep them safe. They, they assume that the policeman is going to be there to, you know, stop anything bad happening. They assume that the laws are there to protect them. And when that when that wobbles, that is a massive source of anxiety. So again, we're in a we're in a situation at the moment where everywhere kids look, there's a there's a challenge to their to their mental health that isn't just them feeling, you know, we're not this isn't about snowflake generations. This is about kids having having a tough time in a way that previous generations just haven't. So I think it's really important that we we recognize that and, and really try and do something about it. And I am going to move on to the what we can do about it now. So um, as I said before, you know, it is really important that um, emotional well-being comes before or alongside academic well-being because it's not it's not an either or. So I think we need to make sure that when we're developing educational content for kids, that it's not at the expense of 
the fun, healthy, social, emotional development stuff as well. Yeah, totally agree. Thank you. Um, and again, like parents are in different situations, I think kids are in different situations as well. And, and they're impacted by societal trends. So things like reduced free time, there's a lot of over scheduling of, of, of kids, you know, off to piano lessons here and Mandarin lessons there and whatever. Um, they have digital play is here to stay. And I think, you know, that's a big yeah. part of our industry. Um, and part of it was, we came, as we touched on earlier, I think it was, um, it was Megan maybe that was earlier was saying about kids not playing out and um, or Rachel, I think, was saying about parents worried about abduction because and, ki and kids are not allowed to play out. And, and traffic is absolutely an issue. But parents fear, yeah. you know, is, is, again, making them make decisions without seeing the biggest, bigger picture, because what we're doing when we're not letting our kids play out with their friends is we're depriving them of an awful lot of really healthy, good p developmental opportunities to to further their sort of soft skills and stuff. So I think yeah. it's it's really important that we recognize where we're at with the kids and we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Tech is digital right. is right. Stay, right? So we've got to make sure that what we're doing as an industry is is good for kids and it's not just mindless, repetitive, solitary, sedentary um, activities that are gonna that's going to fuel their anxiety and lead and, and sort of exacerbate any sort of learned helplessness that they've got. Yeah, and I've had so many conversations recently about um, creating media or sharing media with children that re-engages the sense of imagination. I think there's so much that's pushed to kids these days where, you know, growing up, you know, the imagination was the main thing that you focused on. And I feel that with all of the different ways that kids can consume media, that some of that desire to just be creative and tap into a child's imagination, you know, when you're talking about playing earlier and if it's blocks, are they building a plane or, you know, a house, like letting kids have that ability to fire up their imagination to me is in part fundamental to how kids can, you know, take more power over there or empower them to have a stronger journey in what they want in terms of play as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is, there is a lot we can do as an industry. I think, you know, we, we need to take responsibility for not making mind numbing, repetitive, you know, addictive stuff that is, is going to just keep the kids sat on the, on their sofa on their own or in their room, you know, swiping and swiping. I think, there is, but there is so much good stuff out there, and, and I'm going to come on to some examples of of things that I think work really well as brands and as as an initiatives for kids. Because I think let's let's find the good stuff and let's do more of that. And that's that's absolutely what our our business is about. We you know we help people understand kids, and then we help the good guys do more of it. Because we, I want to live in a world where people who are doing the right thing by kids are getting the commercial advantage. So I think as an industry, if we can adopt that and you know there is so much demand for this sort of stuff that i don't think we need to worry about being you know overly protective of our slice yeah. of the pie we can take the google approach just make the pie bigger the more we're talking about well-being the more we're encouraging healthy play activities the more we're giving children to support their development the better there's billions of kids in the world we don't you know we don't need to be we don't need to be territorial about it all. Well, and, and we learned in talking to a bunch of people making um, content that has a climate element to it. It doesn't have to be a show where the pure purpose of the show is to educate about climate change. You can have households that have a electric car or a compost container on the counter. You can have storylines where there's one character that is really into climate change. You know, I think it's just sort of making some of the anxiety drivers part of everyday life and showing how they're easily solved, not necessarily easily solved, but how people work to feel better about them. That is another way that we can tackle it as well. So, Yeah, absolutely. And I that brings me perfectly onto my next slide, which is um, taking a child's perspective. Um, I think it's so important because we as adults see the world differently. And, and when I do training, in-person training, and I'm not going to ask people to do it now because it'll cause mayhem, but one of my icebreakers is to get people to sit on the floor because their eye level is then at the at the eye at the height of a sort of two three year old, 
and you see the world differently. Your field of vision is smaller. You see the underside of tables. And I was working with a playground manufacturer who ended up putting designs on the underside of their climbing yeah. brake platforms because they'd, they'd understood that actually kids see that stuff. Adults don't. They see down onto things. Kids see up. Um, and being able to see the world through a child's eyes is really important in order to make content that's going to resonate with children yeah. i think it's it's so it's so easy for us to just assume that kids are just smaller versions of adults but all of the research into psychology has, has found that there are qualitatively different um ways of thinking that children you know develop through but you know certainly young children they are they are egocentric. It is about what affects them. It does need to be relatable to them. If we're talking about, you know, we can talk about going to Mars and we can talk about going to grannies. And in the kids' head, there may not be that much difference because, <laughs> they, they, you know, they're both possible, which is also where, you know, when the kids are seeing stuff about Ukraine on the news, they, they don't know that that's the other side of the world. They don't understand... You know, and if they know that their friend's dad is in the army and, you know, it, it, it can very easily get very confused because they don't have that sort of the bigger picture stuff because it's all very much immediate. It's about what's happening in their living rooms, in their homes, in their schools. So I think making sure that we are promoting playful interactions and the positive, um, the positive force that play can bring into a child's life and giving them that opportunity to explore things and ask questions um, I mean, we know that, you know, when you're playing a game with the kids, you get much more out of them than when they come home and you say, what did you do at school today? And they go, oh, not much. Yeah. Whereas you start playing a game or you engage with them with some content or, you know, whatever it is, the conversation just flows. So using the, the kids media, whether it's books or apps or TV programs or toys to really just facilitate those conversations in a natural way, you'll get so much insight with your kids. And then in terms of their mental health and their well-being, they will come to you because they will trust you because they know that you understand them because you've played together for, well, you know, and it's it's that. That's that's the key thing for me for parents is that making sure that helping parents understand the need to keep up with some of the digital stuff that the kids are involved with, engage with the kids with their, you know, with their toys and their activities because when the, the little things are going to be little now, but if they don't talk to you about the little things when they're little, they won't talk to you about the big things when they're big. So we need to give give parents tools and, and support in, in interacting with their kids and making sure that we're seeing things from the kids' perspective and, 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 and addressing those needs now just as much as, you know, for the future. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. I just think it's a different world to parent in right now. And the more that we can evolve the handbook, the proverbial handbook, the better, you know, yeah. there's just so much that's different. Um, and I think, you know, if we're looking at what makes positive uh, media production, but let's focus on the positives because we have an ability to create a caring community, whether that's within a brand or between brands or between children who are, engaging with a brand that's all very very doable and I think that's sort of actively teaching children about their well-being they go through stages so first of all they learn what emotions are called and they start with the basic emotions happy sad angry for you know um right. and then they then they find out then they then they learn what triggers those emotions I'm feeling sad because um, and then they figure out how to manage those emotions. And those three stages, you know, that that's a natural progression. And we can meet kids where they're at, help them learn the names, help them recognize facial expressions, help them understand what they're feeling, then move on to help them understand why they might be feeling that. And that's where some of the narrative around, uh, I mean, some of the really good brands, you know, that narrative comes around comes across really well you know he's feeling sad because he wanted to go to the party and he wasn't invited right. he's feeling you know happy because he won a prize or whatever giving kids that sort of um emotional journey and then then the kind of the mastery of it is is helping them learn how to manage those feelings and again that's that's giving parents tools it's giving it's giving role models it's it's about understanding um, how different people react to different situations and developing that empathy but it's doing it all in an age-appropriate way so there's no point in in talking to two and three-year-olds chapter and verse about you know the amygdala and the need for you to have a balanced 
you know, diet in order to regulate your um, inner, um, yeah, your inner moods and, and your, you know, all of that sort of stuff. It, there's, you've got to be age appropriate with the content and it's got to be fun because, and this yeah, comes out, awesome. yeah. because if you, it doesn't matter how worthy your messages are. If the kids aren't engaging with the content, they're not learning anything anyway. So fun first, absolutely. Um, yeah, I agree, Deborah. Self-awareness, absolutely huge. And making sure that um, that you're seeing yourself honestly as well and, and that kind yeah. of being able to, um, I think I think we, we've all seen the talent shows where you've got somebody who's, who's had everybody sort of telling them how great they are and they get onto stage and they can't hold a tune and yeah. nobody's doing that kid any favours by yeah. bigging him up if he's not, you know. And it's it's about making sure that we are, we're able to be honest in our in our assessment of our own strengths and weaknesses and and be okay with that. I think that that sort of acceptance, as we mentioned earlier, really, really important. Yeah, no, I agree. It's funny, like we, you know, my children are older now, but the as a parent, you want to be the biggest champion of your child, but you also have to be a nurturer and a realist, right? And how do you straddle all of those different roles to create, um, to help form a child um, that feels really strongly about who they are and, you know, their place in the world. It's, it's definitely, I think, much harder these days than it used to be. Yeah, but I mean, I think there are some really great brands that are doing it really well. And I think if, if you're starting out in this industry and you're looking for sort of inspiration, I'm going to go through the different areas of the industry and just highlight some, you know, yeah. some positive so I think there's a lot of similarity between all of these but you know engaging age appropriate developmentally beneficial content absolutely screens should be part of the play it shouldn't be the whole play so you can be online but encouraging offline activities or activities that are social and active so things like the Pokemon Go thing or geocaching those kind of activities are great stuff that encourages you to go and do something with friends afterwards and come back and take take a screenshot of it or, you know, or upload it to something, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing with the screens is anything that's on screens, the characters in there can be so rich and so engaging. So there's an absolutely golden opportunity to more model positive interactions and relationships. And I think you only need to look at some of the brands out there, things like Bluey, things like Octonauts, um, you know, things that are relatable, they're real, they 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 resonate with kids. They're not preachy. They're not, right. but they are, they're role modeling really good relationships. And then you've got things like um, Doc McStuffin and um, there's a new brand coming out, Let's Go See, that is very much about inclusion, diversity and empowering children to be, to follow their dreams. You know, those kind of things are really, really positive in terms of breaking down gender stereotypes and giving children choices and agency about their future. Yeah. And, then, and you've got things like number blocks or alpha blocks where you're, you know, encouraging that numeracy and, and, and school subjects and building kids confidence so that they don't go into school going, I'm no good at math. I don't do math. Right. Um, you know, and I think that's particularly important for girls, but there are some, there are some really great brands out there and there is the mind sort of the mindfulness brands as well. Things like calm and, um, I'm trying to think what it that was oh headspace and headspace, yeah um, you know and there's sesame's done a really nice one breathe i think you know so there's some really good ones there that help children learn how to do it themselves because at the end of the day we don't want to be spoon feeding them um tools to 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 make them feel good about themselves we want them to be able to do that for themselves and you yeah. move as, as you know from you know reward charts for three-year-olds because you're encouraging them to develop their sort of moral framework so hopefully by the time they're a grown up, them having that internalized, they don't need reward charts anymore. They know what's right. They know what's good. And they know what they know how to make themselves feel better if they've had a bad day. So all of that stuff is is really important. But screens are only one part of it. And and I think increasingly we're recognizing that multisensory stuff is is important. So things like books and audio getting, you know, moving away from screens and giving children Again, really good quality content. Um, there's a lot more opportunities with this for it to be a social thing because if you've got audio coming out through the room, yes. lots of you can engage with it together, which means that it's a shared experience, which means that things like humor work really well for audiobooks and, and 
um, apps and stuff and things, um, products like the Tony box, um, absolutely great. You know, those the story boxes that are screen free, but giving that access to literature and, um, and, and stories and engaging. So all the skills that you get from reading, um, comprehension, imagination, developing narrative, all of the vocabulary, all of those kind of things. You don't have to have written words and kids that have got dyslexia or who, who are just reluctant readers can engage and get a load of those skills yeah. from the audio side of things as well. So, and obviously if you're blind or if you've got any other um, impairments that stop you accessing the written world, audio is great, vice versa, if you're hard of hearing um, or you're you're a very visual learner, then then go for the books. But, you know, getting that, content to kids in a, in a fun accessible way and, and making it social and making and that again with parents giving them that opportunity to to you know read stories together and and en enjoy content together I think that's really powerful yeah and you and I talk like I, I love that families are now using um podcasts for bedtime stories and really talking about the story and what's going on and I just think not to ever, I mean, I'm a massive reader, so never want to take the book out of the bedtime stories. But as an alternate, every once in a while, I totally see how that could be really fun to listen to a podcast episode right before bed as well and send your, you know, your kid off onto some wonderful dreams about different worlds and different characters. I think it's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing with books um, is you've got things like the how-to guys and you've got things like journals and reflective journals and and well-being journals where you can you can have a sort of a, a combined creative approach where the kids you've got some prompts there but the kids are actually creating their own narratives and and you know so there's there's a whole load of stuff in the in the books field that can be used to support well-being and it's not just about creating you know great fiction it, fiction and, and stories are, are part of it but there's so much more to it than that so I think you know definitely making sure that when we're producing books and audio for children that we are bearing in mind where they're at what they need and how to how to promote as much of that sort of well-being good stuff as, as we can yeah and then toys and games and i think that again really um really interesting so things we've got loads of of really great toys um and games on goodplayguide.com but things like um things that encourage children to learn about their emotions so um I think there's a pineapple, uh, big big feelings pineapples. I think from Learning Resources is is a perfect example, and it's it's a fun preschool toy, but it's it's got some emotions on it, and and it's about you know talk, just prompting the kids to have those conversations, to learn those learn the name labels for how they're feeling, and and then to start talking about why they might be feeling in different ways. That's all you know, really really important. Um, and then you've got toys that help kids self-regulate so the comforting toys you know things like the weighted blankets and the yeah. the comforters and weighted cuddlies and and all of those kind of um worry eaters those those toys that are designed to help children develop those skills to self-regulate and to feel you know feel better when they are a bit anxious um and then I think there's other toys and games where you're developing through the role play that they encourage, you're developing those skills like the nurturing, like the empathy. So things like the vet kits or the um, doctor's kits, um, those, are, those are really powerful. And again, loads of those sorts of things on goodplayguide.com. Um, so do go and check them out. And I yeah. think that, you know, again, the, the other thing that you get through toys and games, and, and it can be online games as well, but that Learning how to win and lose well is a really important part of mental well-being because if you can win and not be too um, boastful about it and if you can lose and not internalise it as, as you being a failure, again, it builds resilience to the nth degree and it means that you don't get quite so stressed about exams, you don't get quite so hit up about passing tests or anything. So I think it's it's really important that we are promoting play because as a tool for addressing anxiety and, and promoting well-being, I don't think there's much that's better. And the beauty of playfulness is it's not stigmatized. It's not an intervention. It's not something that, you know, you have to get referred for. We can just do it. And if we can encourage families as an industry, if we can encourage families to play better together and to give kids the opportunities to play holistically, 
then I think we are doing our future generations the best service we possibly can. So I think it's that sort of thing just, yeah, that, that's why I get out of bed every day. Yeah, no, I hear it. And I, I, I hear it in your voice, all your passion, which is one of the reasons I adore you so much. <laughs> I also think like I was reading a couple articles how um, modern kids lack some empathy. And I think that play, to your point of the vet kit or Doc McSuffin or any of those kind of toys um, do, you know, further instill that um, skill set of, you know, feeling empathy for something else and then caring for something else um, beyond yourself. Um, and I think that those are really important as well as a skill for life. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I think we're nearly, we're nearly at time up and I wanted yeah. to do, I do want to leave a couple of minutes at the end for, for questions if anybody else has any, but just to refresh. Um, so absolutely as an industry, we need to make sure that we're providing media that supports their well-being and, that's a challenge because they consume it all over the place. But however and wherever they're consuming it, we need to make sure that we're giving them good stuff. I think supporting parents, I think, is is something that we could do a lot better at. And I think that some, there's something there for brands, for kids' brands, to really engage the parents. And I think that whole sort of authenticity for me, it you know, walk the walk. Make sure you are being authentic in your work your approach to well-being because it will resonate through and it will you know if you've got if you if you're prioritizing well-being within your organization then it will be easier for your your team to create great content that supports well-being so there well, might you have to model it too right like i think that's the other thing yeah right? absolutely people people learn from copying yeah and um and I yeah like I said at the beginning I'm a psychologist and I know that however much you've enjoyed today you might go away um and talk about it for five minutes but unless I unless we actually commit something to paper um it might just be something that disappears as you get into work and have your to-do list hit you um so I've got a challenge for you which is a combination of brain heart and hopefully profitability for your business. And what I want you to do is take something that you've thought of, that you've heard today, doesn't matter what it is, and just reflect on it and take an action from that. And it could be something as simple as I'm going to have a conversation with my boss or I'm going to have a conversation with my wife or I'm going to have a conversation with my kids or, you know, I'm going to pull out the script that I got sent last week on such and such and such. And I'm going to reread that. Um, so just it can be a really small action, but tell yourself what you're going to do and give yourself a date. Because if you're if you're as a psychological trick, if you give yourself um, a deadline, you're much more likely to do it. And if you need to figure out who it is you need to get help from to do this. And then close your eyes and imagine how you'll feel um, when you've done it. And that's the last bit. So visualize how when, when you've done whatever it is that you're gonna that you're gonna do, imagine how how much better you're gonna feel. And now I want you to take three deep breaths and give yourself permission to prioritize your own well-being. And with that, I will leave you to your deep breaths. I will leave you to fill in your actions. But if you have any questions, I think Susie, we have about five minutes. Is that right? Yeah, we have about five minutes left. Um, Kendra, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> so a, a quick little antidote that goes into a question. So I was diagnosed with anxiety in the fifth grade, but I very much had it much before that. But I didn't know how to like articulate it to my parents. And it wasn't until I watched a movie with them where a character had a panic attack and I turned to them and I pointed to the screen. And I was like, that's what I feel. And then they took me to the doctor and then we got diagnosed. And so the fact I had never seen it before on the screen, didn't know how to art articulate it, um, I think is just, it, it's just a great example of how the more we start to sprinkle it in um, yeah. to our media, um, kiddos will, you know, start to recognize that it's a normal thing and this is what's going on. So I guess my question is, if you, what are other little things that we can start sprinkling um, into media, whether it's showing a character having a panic attack or just talking about it, sort of what Susie was talking about with the ego, like a family just has, you know, solar panels, little details um, 
that might make it more approachable um, to kids and families. I don't know if you have any uh, shows that you think are doing it really well, or if you have any ideas of what would be great ways to just sprinkle that in a little bit for, for families to start that conversation. I think the, um, the way to do it is, is, is starting as early as you can and normalizing it. Yeah. And in the same way that we need to normalize diversity and inclusion and stuff, so you know, brands that are now doing much better in that space also now need to take that next step and, and look at you know, people who are struggling to communicate how they're feeling, people who are a bit shy about you know, coming forward, people who are masking because they don't want to let their parents down. There's all those kind of things, especially around sort of teenage dramas. Um, we have one in um, uh, in the UK called Tracy Beaker that um, that was that was a really powerful show that was was quite good at dealing with some of those kind of topics. Um, but there's there's quite a lot of that. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for sort of school school based shows mm. to sort of cover some of that. I think, but I think even in the preschool animation type stuff, you can talk about people, you know, characters feeling shy worried nervous yeah. and talk about how and, and show them remedying that what is it that they do to to cope with that and how do they how do they get past that I think that you know there's, it's never too young to do that but doing it in an age-appropriate way I think is really key yeah no I agree I fully agree I mean, I can't thank you enough. I think this was enlightening um, for me, inspiring and wanting me to continue, you know, working with the team here at CMA to do more to help those folks in media, get the tools to them, get the information to them and hopefully inspire even more folks. So um, I know this is the first of a few talks we're going to have, but I, uh, I love this. I thought it was just everything that we should be talking about when it comes to kids and family media. Well, thank you ever so much for inviting me on. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, yeah, it's so, it's such a, an important topic and it's so close to my heart. And I'm a massive believer in, in, in the power of play to solve a lot of these problems. So I'm really keen to, um, yeah, really keen to, to help anybody that's, that's looking at that. Yeah, and we'll put all of um, the links to Amanda's companies on LinkedIn as well, just so that you guys can see the toy report and then also just her other, um, the work that she's doing as well. We have one question. Andrew, do you want to read that one question that just popped in and then we will? Sure thing. So Michael um, is working on a pitch uh, designed for combating childhood anxiety, which is fantastic. And um, he was just wondering if there's any organizations um, that are interested in developing that kind of media. So I don't know if we know of any um, mm -hmm. sort of studios or any just anyone that we think is really on the forefront of this type of content um, that we sort of recommend or that we look to for examples such as this? I don't know if either Susie or Amanda have anything. I don't think there's one studio I would say that's prioritizing. I think all the studios are trying to find the best way to put it into a show. I mean, Teen Wolf had an episode where a character had an anxiety attack. Um, you know, there's still water on Apple that was really talking about being mindful and thoughtful. So I think it's always going to come down to story. And if you have that compelling story that has these tones to it, um, then it's going to find a home ultimately. Um, I wouldn't Personally, I wouldn't lead with that card. I would have that as P, a part of your overall pitch um, and go back to what's the story that you're so passionate about that you want to tell and then add these layers into the story would be my only advice on that one. So, all right, Amanda, you're amazing. You're inspiring and I adore you. <laughs> the first of several that we will have here. Um, but thank you again, everyone for joining us this morning. And we will share more on our next talk in the coming weeks. Okay. Thank Perfect. you. Thanks, Kendra. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.